What's up, folks? I am Jamie Bettingfield. You are listening to my podcast, Too Many Words. Thanks for tuning in and giving me your time. All the shares and downloads are rocking. Your support keeps the show going. If you aren't already, you can subscribe on iTunes and follow the show on Stitcher and Google Play. You can also hop over to patreon.com slash too many words and pledge your support to the show, unlock some fun exclusives, and make me really happy. I am really excited today. I am here with YA author, literary agent, and friend of dogs, Eric Smith. Hey, Eric. How's it going? Hello. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Oh, it was my pleasure. I've been looking forward to it. I actually, I just um, finished The Girl in the Grove this morning over coffee. Oh my goodness. I am not used to people reading that yet. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite things when finishing a book is feeling how important it is. The Girl in the Grove is just a, a super important story and I, I it's going to it's going to touch a, just a lot of people. I can't wait to buy a paper copy for my daughter. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> No, that that is that is okay. It's uh, you know, it's not out till May, so I'm. It's it's always a surprise to hear people have have read it or picked it up or you know scored a review copy on NetGalley. Uh yeah, thank you. Oh my goodness, May. That's uh, that's actually coming up. I know it's really close. <laughs> that's exciting. It's a great time for it to come out too, right before summer. That's a great spring summer read. Yeah, and you know, BEA and all that is around that time, so it'll be a. It'll be a good time to run around screaming about a book. <laughs> <laughs> Are you excited? Yeah, yeah. It's my first, um, especially my first print uh, YA novel. You know, I, I had, um, you know, I had two other YA novels come out, but they were digital only. So this will be the first one I get to put on a uh, on a bookshelf. That's awesome. It, so, yeah, That's a big excited. moment. Yeah, I'll probably cry. You know, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> isn't that part of the whole process along the way? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one of uh, the things that I just I really love your was your use of online forums. Oh, the thank you. Technology is just, I mean, it's it's running rampant, changing everything, and it is just such a big part of kids' lives. And I'm a parent of two, and it's it's mostly terrifying for me. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I really I really liked. How, how that was worked into the story. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was really, like, I really loved how um, uh, Nicola Yoon did it in Everything, Everything. And, like, I kind of wanted to capture something similar, but with, like, the old school sort of stuff that I used to use as a kid. Um, like, in The Girl in the Grove, they're on, like, an old school message board, and, like, the threads go on for a really long time. Uh, and that's, like, something that people don't really use that often anymore, and I kind of wanted to... Uh, have that sort of call back to what my childhood was like. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 87. So mm-hmm. I, I remember when AOL became like what kids did after school. But it's, you know, and I also remember what pagers were and landlines. My, my, <laughs> my eight year old didn't even know, like asked me what a phone was. And I was like, that's a phone. Where's the screen? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm failing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a, I don't know. I have a soft spot for old old social media stuff and old technology. It's, a, uh, I don't know. It's fun. <laughs> I, I definitely old, I definitely own a really old camera that takes uh, floppy disks that I found at a flea market just because I wanted to have it. <laughs> so it's, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> no, I, I'm with you. I mean, uh, I, I draft everything on paper first and I'm, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I, my office is, you know, downstairs and kind of a drafty part of the house. So I have my winter <laughs> hat on and a candle and I'm writing by the paper and pretending I'm having way. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds excellent. Atmosphere is important. It is. It really is. It is. There's something just so major about a book reaching a child, a teen, being that you know that's something that gives them comfort or understanding or escape and books kind of got me through (laughs) a lot of rough times and I really like seeing within the last few years the just powerful and diverse YA especially has really just 
has been flooding the the shelves more and more, and I I want to see it even more. Yeah, yeah, me too. It is it is definitely a great time to uh, it's definitely a great time for kid lit. That that is for sure certain. Um, and you know it's so important. Like seeing yourself in a book when you're when you're younger is just you know that can change your life. You know it makes you feel seen. It makes you feel like there's a place for you, and that's something that you know kids are thinking about all the time. Why am I here? <laughs> you know, what is what is the point of everything? Uh, and getting to see yourself reflected someplace, um, if it if it's a YA contemporary story, or even if it's a story where it's set far, far in the future in a sci-fi novel, uh, it's really important. It, it really is. Um, do you have um, books that you can point to in the early years that had big big impacts on you? Uh, not really. Um, like there there were books that got me into reading most definitely. Um, you know, my parents made me read a lot of those, um, like chunky, like white hardcover, great illustrated classics books where it's sort of like the, the writing is, is a little more accessible for younger kids. Totally. Um, I read, uh, like Jules Verne is what got me obsessed with, with books as a kid. Um, and also seeing Captain, Captain Nemo certainly helped a bit cause you know, he was a Brown guy. Uh, you know, I was a, I was a nine-year-old reading this book, and here's this brown guy with a beard, and I was a nine-year-old with a beard. So it, it all, it all felt, uh, you know, it felt like I was seeing a little bit of myself in the in the in the character there. And then, like the books I read in high school, you know, like I read a lot of, oh, like I loved Nick Hornby. I read I read High Fidelity, and and that sort of made me want to be a writer. Um, <laughs> because in the case of that book, it was it was seeing someone, someone that was a guy sort of wrestling with heartbreak and. And using music to deal with it. And I feel like that's something that teenagers do all the time. But it was sort of the first time I'd seen it in a, uh, you know, sort of a more mature sort of setting. Like, yeah. here's a grown up dealing with something the same way that I've dealt with something. Um, maybe I'm dealing with it okay. Um, that's not necessarily the right answer because I don't think he does deal with things okay <laughs> in that book. Um, but it gives you an idea that, like, you know, people in the real world, you know, they function just like you. It's okay to feel a little lost. It is, and it's it is always nice to get the reminder that it's okay to feel lost. Yeah. So you 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 mentioned just now that uh, about teens using music and losing themselves in music to get through tough times, and uh, I read on your site that you photographed rock bands and toured with them. <laughs> I did. That was like my that was like my past life in college and, <laughs> and a little bit in grad school too. Yeah, I uh, I think photojournalism and and seeing my photography published in magazines, um, and sometimes on you know band CDs that that I think that also fueled my my want to to write more and to be published because that that sort of that sort of satisfaction of people seeing something that you did you know out there in the world is uh is really great. Yeah, um, yeah. What are some of the bands that? Um, it was mostly like pop punk bands and like emo bands. Um, oh goodness. Uh, like bands on like Epitaph and like drive through records, like farewell was a band I went out with a few, uh, once, um, Socratic, uh, cute is what we aim for. Well, it was a slightly bigger band that I, I went on the road with. Um, Oh geez. Forever the sickest kids. That was a, that was a bigger group. Okay. Um, yeah. Bands like that. Oh man, yeah, but- I, I went I went through a phase where I was just utterly obsessed with Taking Back Sunday, and I had the parted hair and the lip ring and nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, uh, when I was in high school, me and some friends um, got in, pretty involved with setting up uh, venues for like teen bands to have little, you know, uh, concerts and stuff, and it was all you know just inside this very small pocket of North Jersey, but it felt fun making flyers and telling people to go listen to this, you know, three part band. (laughs) Yeah, no, that was, uh, that was definitely a big part of my life (laughs) as a, as a teenager, the being a quote unquote scene kid. Yes. Um, (laughs) my my next, my next book that I'm writing is actually, uh, being co-written with a, uh, pop punk star, but I can't say who it is. Oh man. uh, it's exciting. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm definitely going to keep my eye out for that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. When I when I read Scene Kit, I was like, okay, that's somebody that can appreciate some emo. <laughs> Ab- oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, writing a book is just a great 
long, twisty path. But is there a, an original seed that you can point to that um, kind of led to the girl in the grove? Uh, yeah, you know, so I'd, I'd probably say it was that seed is basically my wife. Um, <laughs> she is uh, always pushing and trying to get me to write, you know, slightly more serious sort of books. I don't know, I guess I gravitate towards writing like fluff a little more than uh, that I do uh, getting very serious. And yeah, when I was working on the adoption anthology, she was telling me, you know, you need to write more about adoption. You need to write more about your feelings and, and the things you went through. And I, I forget exactly how the, the, the sort of tree idea came up. But one, one of the things that I, I'd been thinking a lot about at the time was, um, you know, my wife uses a, um, a, a sad lamp. I was thinking about that and the light and how it reflects on a person and how sunlight reflects on a tree. Um, and I don't know, something just stewed around up there until, until something <laughs> uh, ended up coming out where I, I wanted to write about these dryads and then, then a person uh, that sort of experienced a uh, similar sort of um, I don't know, reaction to what the world is like. Uh, and then this, this is what ended up, uh, ended up happening. And like, ah, I definitely talked about this book for for a while before I even dug into writing it. I, I feel bad for some of my friends who had to <laughs> put up with me talking about the book that didn't exist, but I kept talking about it nonstop. But finally, I I, I wrote it, and now it's here. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it does. It it takes a a certain amount of just stewing over it for it to become something. It's actually like, I don't know, the creation process, the way, the, the path that you have to follow and the things that you have to do for, you know, the actual scene to come forth and, and how the story develops. Sometimes it feels like it's like, you know, you get to write, but there's this, there's this something greater that's like, you know, some sort of magical power that you're tapping into. It's like almost like it's pre-existing, but you just have to find the pieces to, to make, to put it together. Yeah. You got to find all those little puzzle pieces. Yeah. So um, you are, so you're a YA author and you're also a literary agent. Yes. How do you find that the knowledge from one helps the other? Um, well, I feel like the knowledge of like writing YA definitely helps me represent it a little bit better, but it's, it's, I feel like sometimes it's less about writing it as opposed to just reading as much of it as I can. You know, I, I wanted to write YA, um, you know, a couple of years ago. So I just consumed as much of it as I could in a very short period of time. Uh, and now I probably read, I don't know, a book or two a week. And sort of that push to, to get myself writing what I wanted, it helped me be able to actually work on those kind of books. So it's more about being sort of an avid consumer and fan of the category as opposed to, to writing it that helps. Uh, did you, um, you, you mentioned that when you were in high school is, is when you started thinking about, you know, being a writer and how that kind of, did you put your foot in the door as a writer first or were you um, getting into the other side of the industry, you know, kind of simultaneously? Uh, it's probably the, probably a little of both at the same time. Um, like I originally went to college uh, as like a theater playwriting major <laughs> and I had this great professor who was like, so Eric, you know, you're, you're doing all these plays and I know you don't like them. You're not very good. Uh, you know, maybe you could be an English major and then you could just focus on the writing. And I was like, you know, that's a good idea. And it's sort of, I don't know, brutal feedback ended up changing my life in a really great way. <laughs> College, you know, I was writing short stories as everybody does. And then I, I started blogging a lot and blogging is what got me my first job in Philadelphia as a, as a sort of writing copy and, and, and blogging full time. Uh, and then once I finished grad school, you know, that's when it was, I don't know, that's when I got into publishing and, and started taking things a little more seriously. So it, it took me a little while to, to kind of get there. My, my first traditionally published book didn't happen until, oh goodness, Geek Dating came out when I was, uh, when I was 30. So yeah, it took a little bit, but we got there. I, I hear that from so many. I mean, it is such a journey that takes a while and you just have to keep, keep plugging away. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> What are some reads that uh, you think everyone should should consider? Hmm. Let's see. Uh, like current favorites or like evergreen favorites? I guess um, recent. I mean, because like if you were to ask me, one of the first books that would come out of my mouth would be Unkindness of Magicians by Cat Howard, which I read oh, in yeah. October, but I'm still thinking about it. 
No, that book is great. She actually helped edit one of my uh, author's books, whose book I sold uh, just a couple, like just last month. Oh, she's wow. um, she's amazing. I I am such a fan. So she edited uh, my current work in progress. Oh wow! Well, that that is awesome. All right. So recent reads that I was I've been really into. Um, I picked up um, Olivia A. Cole's a Conspiracy of Stars. It's just really intense, uh, like YA sci-fi novel that. I mean, teens are fighting monsters in like jungles on different planets. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of like sort of dark political secrets going on in this sort of like fantasy meets sci fi uh, mashup. It's really exciting. It's like this awesome, diverse book. I'm trying to yell at everybody I can to, uh, to pick it up because it's, it's not getting the amount of buzz I think it, it should be getting. It just came out uh, know, like two weeks ago. Okay. No, um, I haven't heard of it until just now. It sounds amazing. I'm definitely going to yeah. pick it up. Oh, it's great. Who else? Uh, I, re- I loved Far From the Tree by Robin Benway. Uh, it won the National Book Award. Uh, it came out last year. It's about um, like these three adopted kids you know, and their, their sort of struggles. Uh, I've been telling everybody I know to read Starfish by Kimmy Bowen. It came out uh, last year. It's this really awesome novel about a um, like a half Asian, half white girl who sort of wrestles with identity. She wants to go to art school, and her family keeps shutting her down. And it's just this really intense, like quiet, like emotional uh, novel about a girl, you know, dealing with like abuse at home. Uh, who kind of just wants to you know get away from it all and pursue her dreams, um, and it got long listed for the Morris Award, wow. uh, which is really exciting. Yeah, no, I mean, and oh, and then uh, oh, Chainbreaker by Tara Sim. It's a uh, sequel to uh, Timekeeper. So if you haven't read that, pick it up. Uh, it's this awesome like steampunk YA novel about uh, sort of a, an alternate London where everything, all all the gigantic clocks, like Big Ben s clocks. Um, don't just tell time, they control time. So every city has a clock. Um, if the clock is broken, the city can freeze uh, in time. And it's about a, a teen who is a, uh, a clock fixer. He goes around fixing these clocks and falls in love with the clock spirit. And it's just this gorgeous steampunk fantasy LGBTQ romance adventure that I keep screaming about. So that's, that's another one. And the sequel just came out. Uh, and the sequel takes place in India. And it's just awesome i have not read the sequel yet but i am it's highly anticipating it i love timekeeper oh so great so great it's just uh you gotta love those stories that just like wash over you and then you're like what (laughs) (laughs) you know it's that like yeah it's good stuff i uh i recently read um the girl with the red balloon by Catherine locke oh yeah and uh, that is just a incredible uh, combination of history and magic and hope. It's I can't say enough good things about it. Yeah, Catherine's amazing. She's one of my uh, CPs. She worked on The Girl in the Grove with me when we still lived in Philly. Oh, yeah? At least when I, when I did. She still lives in Philly. Yeah, I just recorded a conversation with her. She's awesome. Mm-hmm. Publishing industry has really just... I mean, it has changed so much in the last 10 years. And in the last, I want to say, four, did, you know, the the internet really just opened up a whole community. What are, I guess, some positive changes that you've noticed and then negative impact that technology has had on the publishing industry? Well, it's just, it feels like more of a community, you know? Yeah. Um, like, I'm in sort of the odd position where I, I kind of got into publishing, oh, I don't know, like seven years ago at this point, eight years ago. So I kind of got into it during this uh, sort of upheaval stage. But yeah, it's, that definitely feels like more of a community. You know, there's, you don't have to look too far to find someone to, to network with and to talk with and to figure out how things work. Um, it's all very accessible. It's all very easy to find. Um, but on the other end of that, that's also somewhat of a negative because there's a lot of bad advice out there. Um, anyone can start a blog <laughs> and dish out all their writing tips um, when maybe they're you know not published or you know just not someone you should be listening to about advice on how to get a book deal. Yeah. Um, 
So you know, the positive side is that there's a lot of connectivity, and the negative side is that there's a lot of connectivity. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep, a lot of noise, both yeah. both good and bad. Yeah, it's also easier to to rally around causes um, in the book community now that there's this great online platform, and me and you know toxic books show up, and it's way easier to get people on board with discussing why they're bad, <laughs> why they why they can be hurtful. Um, and then there's the other side of the thing where it's, you know, voices coming together to, you know, get more diverse books out there, you know, and, and, and just pushing, um, you know, pushing publishers to, to, to make the changes uh, that they should have been making uh, years ago because now you kind of can't hide from us because everybody is uh, on the Internet and can, uh, can reach out and find people. So it's, it's, it's pretty great. I love it. It's just so awesome. Um, and the community is something that's growing and it feels like it's getting stronger. And, you know, there's been several, you know, threads and trending tweets that have, you know, made an impact on, on individuals voice. And that is something that I really hope to just see grow into a, a, into a giant superpower. I agree. Yes, please. Yes. Superpowers um, that revolve around kindness Mm-hmm. You have a twice monthly podcast with Book Riot. I do. Hey, YA, where I, I talk about books with uh, my pal Kelly Jensen. That's awesome. How do you pick your books? Uh, we usually just pick, um, we pick like themes for every episode. So like, um, you know, one episode we talk about, we talked about books that were missing from most anticipated lists. So we just prattled on about books that we think people should be looking for. Um, it's really just based on, on what we like kind of, and what, what's sort of on our radar. That's how, that's how I pick books and guests for my show as well. <laughs> <laughs> what do I want to read? Mm-hmm. Um, well, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the show. I had a lot of fun talking with you. Oh, my pleasure. No, this is lovely. Um, could you, uh, Tell everybody where they can find you on uh, the internet. Sure. If you go to uh, ericsmithrocks.com, that URL is sort of left over from my band photography days. Um, (laughs) You can find information about my books. You can find information about my clients' books. Uh, And that same little name, Eric Smith Rocks, is where you can find me on Twitter and on uh, Instagram. Um, I don't know if you want to follow me on Instagram. It's mostly pictures of my baby and my dog, but, you know. Some people like dog photos, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's funny. My my uh, my oldest, she had my phone the other day, and she said, "Mom, you have more pictures of the dogs on your phone than you do of me and my brother." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "I'm sorry." <laughs> well, awesome, Eric. Thanks so much. No, no problem. Thanks for having me on. All right, guys. Well, that wraps it up for this week. You can follow me on Twitter at me Bettingfield. Follow the show at Too Many Words Pod. Come visit the site tmwpod.com, patreon.com slash too many words and pleasure support the show. Thanks so much for tuning in and for all your your spreading the word and your support. I hope you uh, have a good week, good weekend, and I will talk to you next Thursday with Delilah S. Dawson. Over and out.